trying to find my husband. You are a private investigator, mm. is that correct? Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned it, because that brings me to rule number three. I don't talk about my past. We're just having a conversation. You want to do that up here? I prefer to look people in the eye when I talk to them. What you did. Dishonors all cops. There's a lot of isolation, there's a lot of pain, uh, there's a lot of darkness, you know. I, I like to call it jungle noir, where it's definitely noir as the, rum as the thunder rumbles. After I signed on to direct Tropo, I decided to read the novel written by Candace Fox. It's called Crimson Lake because I wanted to get a sense of where did this story come from? Where did Candace mean for it to be set? Tropo takes place in the wilds of far north Queensland. It's a kind of jungle frontier community. About time someone took an interest in what's going on here. Well, place is out of whack. People are going Tropo. No. Driven mad by the tropical heat. So we set ourselves an incredibly difficult task as a murder mystery to have not one mystery, not two mysteries, but three mysteries. One in the present, which is the disappearance of Zhong Min, the brilliant tech engineer. The second mystery is the horrible death of Lars Hansen. And the third mystery is what actually happened with Amanda's crime in the past. These characters are flawed and have done some really terrible things. But at their core, they're good people. That girl's a ticking time bomb. She'll go off again. I find myself very often drawn to stories where they kind of centre around unlikely friendships or connections that kind of come in, in ways that you wouldn't expect. And, you know, it's these sort of to people who are both in similar predicaments but are polar opposite as human beings and being kind of forced to come together in a common purpose. What fascinated me about the book and, and something that we've tried to do in the show as well is this sense of that whilst they're investigating the, the cases that brought them together, there's also an element of investigating each other. Knock, knock. Hey. So is this your day job? It's my side hustle. All these years, too? Uh-huh. Huh. Look out here. Oi, no. Don't. Right. Setting the look of the show is the responsibility of so many different heads of department and it's such a crucial thing to get right. I think we were really, really lucky to have a DOP of Martin McGrath's calibre come on board the project. I think these days, if you, if you don't go bold, you, <laughs> you just don't register. Certainly the story gave us the licence to be bold and the writing led us there without a doubt. I put a lot of backlight into things, I created a lot of contrast. I wanted drama and I think we were able to get there. Our production designer, Nick McCallum, is a genius. Essentially, my job is to give the biggest canvas I can for the cast and for the uh, director to be able to drive the drama. I don't think we could have ever dreamed that we would be able to build and construct the shark bar. When you can't find what you're imagining in your mind, to have the capacity to have somebody design that and execute it and, and gift it to you. Give me your whiskey. Hey, nice. I get it. You're the gatekeeper. There are so many angles. There are so many ways you could shoot a scene. You'll never get bored. It was a dream for a director. When we were looking at building Ted's house, the art department discussed with us the potential of buying a house that we really liked and trucking it down to our location. And we found this old house and we bought it and it was then cut in half, placed on two gigantic trucks. So this took a military operation to bring it here and then it's put together again. Just looking at the photos, the detailing of the sort of stained glass windows and it's just, it felt the perfect level of dilapidated uh, and just was so visually striking. I can't imagine Ted living anywhere else at this point. It's given the camera department so much to shoot and us so much to play within. 
We're done here, man. Okay, we are. I think the idea of being able to tell a story over an eight-hour period of time and to get to kind of go really deep into into character, that was a real draw card for me. It's folding the exposition that's necessary so that we're following along of the whodunit of it all and injecting that with a sense of humanity, making it about Ted and Amanda and their journey as they're trying to figure out who done it. And it is, it's, it's, a, it's an old-fashioned who done it murder mystery. <laughs>